Hello and welcome to lesson 17 of the learning guitar series. Uh, this time we discuss, we start discussing right hand techniques and in particular we'll, uh, we'll focus on alternate picking and in the future we'll look at the uh, legato and uh, speed picking, uh, economy picking, etc. Um, in my opinion, no one technique is more important than another. You know, they're, they're just different and they might serve different purposes or uh, they might facilitate, you know, the way you want to play. Each of them has got advantages and disadvantages and, and we'll discuss them uh, as we go. Uh, as usual, there is a PDF attached to this lesson. Make sure you download it so you can kind of follow the things I'm talking about. Uh, by now, I am kind of moving all the lessons um, and the PDFs to Patreon. I recently opened a Patreon page uh, because actually that allows to have all the lessons in one place and all the PDFs. Uh, so it kind of makes it easier, you know, to find them, download them, uh, you know, and have them all collected together. Uh, easier than using Google Drives on each of them kind of thing. Uh, of course, the lessons are still free and, uh, you know, you can download the PDFs for free. Um, that's the spirit of uh, what I'm doing, after all. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to support the project, which of course is very much appreciated, you can do that. And it's like, it's $3.60 a month. Which I think is kind of like, you know, uh, uh, worth it uh, <laughs> for what we're doing. Uh, at the same time, I want to keep this uh, free for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, because that's the spirit of it. Uh, also because, uh, you know, some people can, uh, can uh, not afford at the moment to actually spend money on this. And uh, other for COVID reasons, uh, which is why I started this in the first place. Um, but also because, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, not all of us live in uh, developed countries and so in some places, you know, it's nice if people that could not afford these kind of lessons, they still have access to them and they still have access to the PDFs. So uh, if you can afford it, uh, I appreciate uh, your contribution to the project very much. And if you cannot, you know, don't feel guilty about it and just enjoy it, you know, and hope, uh, hopefully you'll learn something out of it. Uh, so the lessons are there. Uh, I uploaded also the previous one in terms of PDFs, so you'll find the link into, into the uh, into the description to the video. Um, so let's delve into it. Uh, alternate picking or picking in general. I'm actually going to discuss this from a little bit earlier. Um, somehow, I don't want to say a beginner level, but just a brief, very brief discussion uh, about you know starting from the pick itself. Um, why? Well, because you know, different picks. By now, you know it. They come. They can come in different size, different shapes, and you know, so forth and so on. So um, different thickness. Okay. What should we use? Well, in discussing picking in general, uh, I don't think my experience tells me that there are no you know rules. Um, I don't want to open like a kind of worms where I tell you like this is done this way or this is done that way. Because there is plenty of musicians, musicians out there who kind of don't um, apply these rules to their playing and still achieve some fantastic results. So me telling you you should all depict this way or that way, it kind of makes no much sense to me. If anything, hopefully this lesson will, will explain you the logic of things, as usual. And if you understand the logic of things, uh, you will probably find what works for you. You know, that, and that's the entire idea. Okay, so we have picks which have different thickness. Let's start from that. So in this case, I'm holding something which is uh, two millimeters, and this is a very very thin one. This is probably 0 0.5 or 0 0.7, and of course there is picks of uh, different size. This is like smaller, bigger, uh, much bigger, <laughs> and you know, as I say, you'll find what works for you. In my experience, personal experience, uh, I tend to use very Thin picks, like very thin, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. If I'm doing strumming work, so let's say acoustic guitar, literally like strumming work, so you know, that kind of thing. Especially if I'm playing um, a guitar in a pop song or in a pop mix, because it gets you less bass and it's kind of more uniform as a sound, uh, you, get, you get more trebles out of it. So it kind of tends to sit already better in the mix with the other instruments, okay? 
and you know it just it just works for me as i said it, let's not make a rules out of this i'm telling you how i feel about it but you know it doesn't mean that you can use a very thick pick and do the same but as you can see the volume is much louder for a start compared to okay and as i said it's a thinner sound itself brighter in a way uh with slightly less attack obviously and uh, it kind of works well for me when I'm, when i'm doing strumming parts okay and of course there is a whole uh, range in between 0.5 and 2 millimeters i mean it's like it's everything in between so you might want to try 0 0.7 1 millimeter 1.2 and see what works for you uh if i'm doing most of the time i'm, I'm dealing with lead parts especially if i'm playing jazz in that case i prefer to use a much thicker pick uh, again a, a, a bigger attack you get out of it uh, I like the tone of it. Uh, there is a little more. There is more bass to the notes, so especially when you, when playing um, high strings. I get a darker sound compared to if I use a tin pick. So I tend not to like very much tin picks, especially on on the top strings. You know. Okay, personal preference, uh, and the reason I'm saying this is, say for example, you take a musician like Bob Mattini, and he uses incredibly thin picks, okay, and he doesn't use actually the tip of it, he, he has it on the, you know, on this other side of the pick. By using EQ, he still gets an incredibly warm sound, and you know, he started that way, he feels comfortable that way. As I say, let's not make rules. I'm just telling you in general what you can get out of it, and then you'll try and you'll figure it out yourself. Okay. Uh, again, tone pick has got a, a, a lot of uh, influence on the tone you're gonna get out of the guitar. As we say, like a thinner pick, obviously you'll get a brighter sound and less bass as opposed to a, uh, as opposed to a thicker thicker one. Also, it kind of changes according to the tone changes according to if you're playing. Closer to the bridge, closer to the bridge, or closer to the neck. So you're gonna get a more, let's say, scooped, you know, scoop the meats kind of sound. If you're playing closer to the neck, as opposed to a sound which has more upper mids, more bright, a brighter tone, more twangy. Tone. I think that's probably would be a good definition of it. If you're playing closer to the bridge, to. so you get more uh, low mids, more bass, a little bit, bit less, 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 uh, less mids. Okay. Um, now, another consideration we need to do is where does the right hand sit when it comes to the guitar, okay? Again, I've seen many different musicians having their, you know, main hand position, very different, like a floating, you know, actually it's on the guitar, so you see what I mean? So where the wrist is angled this way, and the guitar, basically you, you're kind of feeling where the strings with the guitar with the knuckles of your hand. Uh, an example of somebody that plays like that that comes to mind is Jim Hall. Okay, and you know, again, nothing wrong with that. It's actually not a position that I'm very common personally use. Uh, also, gypsy guitar players tend to do that too. The reverse of it was a hand that kind of sits this way as opposed to this way, okay, where the side of your uh, hand kind of is kind of touching the bridge as an anchor point and we'll discuss anchor points in a second and again same kind of same kind of rule i mean you find what works better for you um in this case i don't see uh, necessarily advantages or disadvantages of one or the other okay uh, in particular with the when it comes to the how you hold your hand to me what's relevant is is the angle that the pick has compared to the strings. What I mean by that is when the pick is angling, is, is pointing towards down, okay? 
Now, especially when it comes to alternate picking, the, the issue you'll have with that is that, of course, when you're picking that up, it's okay. Like, you, you, it's, a, it's in the direction of the strings, right? But when you pick up, you're actually going away from the guitar, okay? Which might make things a little bit awkward when you're trying to do alternate picking, okay? Uh, different uh, if you're doing sweep picking, if you're doing flat picking, etc. Um, where gypsy picking, you know, where uh, uh, the pick sits on the strings, okay? Um, same thing if I was arching the pick towards the other direction. So now alternate, you know, upstrokes, they're kind of okay. They're pointing towards the guitar, but upstrokes, uh, downstrokes are actually going away from the guitar. So in a way, you know, we could say, at least that's how I feel about it, that having the pick kind of perpendicular to the strings when it comes to alternate picking kind of allows us to give the same weight to both uh, downstrokes and upstrokes, okay? So it's not like this, it's not like this, but it's like this. Okay? Um, <coughs> and some people hold the pick in a fist, uh, I'm thinking Frank Ballet, for example, tends to do that. Um, some other people likes to keep those fingers out, okay? Um, I think John Petrucci does that. I'm not completely sure. You might correct me on that. Correct, correct me on that when it comes to the... Leave it in the comments. Um, again, in the wrist, it feels to me that you have a better grip on the pick. As in, there's less chances of it flying away, okay? And a little bit more freedom in going up and down the, the six strings, okay? With the hands open, of course, like, you can touch your pick guard, then that gives you an anchor point. And what I mean by anchor point is, like, something that gives you a feeling of where the strings are at all time. Of course, if your hands is floating, you don't know where the strings are, okay? You only know it when you play, okay? Instead like this, I always feel independently. I know where my fifth string is, where my second string is, just because I'm touching something on the guitar. And anchor points can be your fingers, obviously. And as I said before, if, you're, if your wrist is sitting on the bridge, that also does. Yeah. And for those of you that use eye gain, so distortion in general, uh, that also allows you a certain degree of noise control, okay? Um, <clears throat> I think that kind of clarifies. clarifies. I said, these are different ways. My suggestion for ultimate picking, as I said, is to keep the pick kind of perpendicular to the strings, not pointing up, not pointing down. Um, and we'll get back to that in a second. You'll understand the logic why I'm saying that. As I said, if you understand the logic of what I say, then you figure it out yourself. I'm not telling you you should do this or you should do that. I'm just trying to portray a, a, a general picture coming from my, you know, 15, 20 years of experience, okay, of playing. The angle of the pick. Now, as you noticed before, the way I'm um, angling it is literally perpendicular to the strings, okay? So... Now, I can also angle the pick instead of being this way, being this way, okay? What that allows me, so this position as opposed to this position, and just by, I can do that just by flipping this joint in my thumb, okay? I can go there, I can go there. Now, this solves one issue with alternate picking. I mean, one that can be an issue. So the fact that when you're very perpendicular to the strings, there might be a lot of pick going into the strings. So there is a chance that the pick will get stuck, okay? Limiting your speed. When you have an, an, an angle, there is less chances of a pick ending up in the middle of the strings. Okay, as opposed to, to a very perpendicular position. Um, differences. Well, I'm going to try and play with the same kind of strength and then angle the pick so you can actually maybe hear the difference. To me, uh, when I'm very perpendicular, when there is no angle, uh, I get a more defined attack and a more defined sound. So, as opposed to...
So the attack of the notes is more pronounced when it's very perpendicular compared to when it's at an angle. This is definitely more noticeable when you're using a clean sound. When you're using a distorted sound, especially high gain sound, it's a bit less noticeable. Still there, but slightly less noticeable. So in terms of using a clean sound, I tend to prefer a perpendicular approach, but I will eventually angle it if I'm trying to play something faster or maybe something more difficult. And as I say, distortion, especially when it comes to ultimate picking, we'll see that in a second once I show you the exercises we're doing. Uh, a clean sound and a distortion sound is kind of different, especially I gain. So those playing metal and prog rock and all that kind of jumps. Um, reason being that distortion itself compresses the sound. And because it compresses the sound, so the dynamic range of the sound is, 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 is smaller. Um, that allows less effort, obviously, in terms of ultimate picking, because the consistency of the volume, it's easier to achieve compared to if you're trying to do the same uh, on a clean sound. And so, like when you're playing distorted, you can definitely take advantage of that, and you know, and 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 use this idea of actually flipping the joint when you want to angle your pick, maybe for faster passages, or even in general. As I say, the tone you get is slightly different, and you might like it more. You know, there is nothing wrong with that. So, as you can see, like, and you know, as we will see in a second, uh, it's basically this motion. You know, so like your joint. Hold on, so put it this way, your joint is going from uh, concave, I think it's called, you know, to this. And that's simply, just by that motion, you're kind of changing the angle of a pick. Um, how are you supposed to hold the pick in the first place? Sorry, I kind of skipped ahead in a way that should have been disguised. Well, most of the people seems to all that, you know, from the, this part of the thumb and the side of your second finger, right? I say most of the people, okay? Because also you can even hold it this side of the thumb, but also this side of the second finger, so literally like this, okay? Which allows you like kind of a stronger grip. You know, there is less chances of the pick moving around when you're playing compared to when it's on the side. Okay, again, is that a rule? Not really. Um, look at George Benson <laughs> and his ultimate picking. I mean, he holds it uh, with, the, with the inside. Okay, so top here, top here. Okay, and actually, he points the, the pick in that direction. Okay, most of us, we tend to, as I said, we flip it, and if it's at an angle, the angle is facing that way. In this case, it's facing the other way kind of unorthodox. If you want to think in terms of there should be a rule about this, to me it's not unorthodox. It's just, he's, he's playing, George Benson playing, is fantastic. So, you know, we're not going to argue what's correct and what's not correct. Okay, what works for you? But be aware, you get a, you get a, a great grip that way. Um, I also heard people uh, saying that the pick should not be loose as in should not be able to float too much when you're picking, okay? As, because there is this chance of the pick getting stuck in the strings, the, 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 the firmer, I mean, if you're firm in the way you hold it, so you cannot wobble, right? It should make your life easier in terms of, uh, you know, not losing the control of it. There is some truth to it. My opinion is also true that if you let it wobble a little bit, when you feel like, especially when we we'll we'll look at uh, maybe techniques like sweep picking or legato, etc., it also allows you to change the direction of the pick, you know, and that's also important. That can be achieved with the wrist, okay? Just by doing this, I'm changing direction on the pick. Let me see if I can, yeah, right? And that's a wrist motion. But I can also do it with my thumb, as we said before. <laughs> I just change the direction of the pick. Put it this way, so it's okay. Again, something else that you might want to try and, and see how it works. So, just to recap quickly before we get into the exercises first of all, thickness of the pick, 
a tin pick, a, a tick pick, anything in, in between. Different style of music or different sounds you want to achieve. You don't have to use one, okay, all your life. You can, I, I, I use several ones, okay, depending on what the job at end is. If you want to use one, it's also correct. As I said, there is no rule. Uh, where do you place your hands? Where are you playing? Closing to, closer to the bridge, closer to the neck. You're gonna get a different tone out of that. So a different tone because of the pick you use and a different tone because where you sit your hands. And of course you can move it. Like classical players do this all the time just to get a different tone out of the guitar. More trebly, less trebly. Uh, where does the hand sit when you want to anchor it? If you're anchoring with your fingers, if you were want to just use your wrist, your wrist on the, uh, on the bridge, okay? And have this kind of motion. And of course, the angle of the pick, are you perpendicular to the strings and you get a certain attack out of it? Or you're gonna angle it and get a different attack? Again, try this with a clean sound, or with a distorted sound, so you can hear the difference. Now, the muscles involved in picking, uh, uh, and in particular, we're gonna look it into our alternate picking. Well, I, like, I tend to subdivide the muscles involved in three parts. So first of all, I can alternate pick just by using my, literally, the, 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 the joint in my thumb. What I mean is, let me see if I can show it to you this way, is just by changing this part here, I'm alternate picking, okay? And by the way, alternate picking, I mean, I'm, I guess I don't have to explain the principle behind it. It's literally a sequence of up, down, up, down, up, down, in terms of how you are picking, uh, stroking the strings, right? So. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And no matter what I'm doing, if it's a scale, if it's an arpeggio, the sequence is always down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay? So, back to the muscle. This is just my thumb, you know, using the joint. And, you know, I can. And I can move around with that. The second part is the wrist. Okay? So I can also alternate pick by keeping the thumb uh, fixed. By doing, it, I can do that, for example, just by keeping it arched and not allowing it to bend. Okay. In that case, if I do that, the picking is coming from the wrist. Okay. Elbow and shoulder, so this part here. In that case, basically, it's your arm moving. Okay. As you can see. That kind of motion. Um, in terms of precision, alternate picking is a bit like having a compass. I don't know if you've done geometry, but but what's happening is basically you're moving your wrist like this. Okay, designing a little compass and. Of course, you want to keep this kind of motion as small as possible. You're trying not to go away from the strings. Okay, that at least that will give you chances in terms of speed. Okay, because if I do this, it's like say I'm playing on the sixth string. Now I'm so far away from the string. That's still alternate picking, but I'm still going very far. But you can see this kind of compass kind of motion. Okay. Of course, if I keep it close. If I do that motion very small, you can you know, achieve much more, um, a faster speed. Okay. Uh, in terms of achieving this small uh, distance, that these three muscles, like look at all the muscles. I mean, maybe, maybe they're not, but anyway, thumb, uh, wrist, and elbow, shoulder. They're kind of proportionally inversed in terms of the speed they can achieve, but also the precision they can achieve. What I mean by that is your thumb motion can be incredibly precise. Okay, you can do some very small arches with your pick just by using your thumb. Okay, it can be very precise. The downsides of it, I think there is a police passing by. Uh, the downside of it, um, downside, downside of it, is speed. It's difficult to be fast with your thumb. There is 
so much I can achieve in terms just by using my joints to do that. Okay. The wrist is indeed faster, so I'll lock it so that it's just wrist. Especially if I angle the back. Okay? But the arches I can design tend to be slightly larger. It's less, your wrist is less precise compared to the thumb. Okay? And to close this chapter, you know, elbow and shoulder. Elbow and shoulder can be much faster than, you know, the two of them, right? But as you can notice, the level of precision, the arches I can design, it starts to be much larger, much less precise. Okay. So in a way, picking is the combination of all this, depending on how fast you're playing, the kind of music you're playing, and as I said, what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day is it's, it's about you playing your own music and you know whatever whatever serves your own music that what works. As I say I don't want to make rules, but I just want you to pay attention to these things so that if you encounter any problem, you might find yourself how to solve it, in a way. Hopefully I'm explaining you the logic behind things. Personally, I tend to use a combination of the first two. I don't use my elbow and shoulder very much. But they're there. They're still there. In terms of uh, listening to some musicians who use alternate picking to a very high level, I already mentioned George Benson. Uh, we need to mention Aldi Meola. Uh, you might want to research him if you don't know him. Um, started out in the 70s, incredibly alternate picking technique, especially because there's one album in particular I suggest you to listen because it's really impressive, which is Friday Night in San Francisco. Uh, it's an album that you, I think you recorded in the 80s with uh, John McLaughlin which is another incredible alternate picker, and you definitely want to check him out, you know. Also because you notice uh, their hand position being different. And, and as I say, I'm trying not to make a rule out of anything, I'm just trying to explain you things, because already, like, by looking at those two musicians, they're both impressive when it comes to alternate picking. And yet the way they approach it is, like, is, is kind of different. And what's fantastic about that album, and that's why I'm suggesting it to you, is because they all play, there is Paco de, Paco de Lucia also, the flamenco player, and he's, he's, he's a fingerstyle player. Because they're all using acoustic guitars, and alternate picking on acoustic guitar is hard. <laughs> I cannot stress enough how hard that is. Uh, I don't mean to say that, you know, it's easier to do it uh, with distortion, uh, you know, Tin strings and all that. I mean, as I say, the different genre of music. But if you're, if you want to study alternate picking, that's definitely, definitely a reference of a very high standard of achievement. Of course, John Petrucci, also is somebody that you want to check out. So I guess Dream Theater, incredibly alternate picker. Um, Steve Morse, which is, you know, by the way, Aldimeo, like, is kind of a guy who influenced a lot of people like Petrucci, you know, he mentions that, I think, sometimes. Steve Morse, also incredible, uh, alternate picker. I mentioned George Benson, Ingle Malmsteen. I mean, I'm sure there is many, many, and, you know, if you have, you know, if you want to suggest some to the people that watches these videos, just put it in the comments. Yeah, to the video and so that other people can check out stuff that I don't know, you know, I'm sure there is many of there. I'm just mentioning the one that, uh, you know, that I know that influenced me. Uh, but as I say, there is people, you know, that uses uh, a weird techniques. I mean, like, weird position, look at Steve Morse and the way he plays arpeggios with alternate picking. It's quite amazing. And of course, it seems to be embracing the guitar and picking from the center because that allows the wrist to get to top strings and bottom strings, you know, it, it, it's a bit like saying your straight position is in the center, so you can do this, you can do this, as opposed to most of us seems to be attacking the strings from above, and we go down the strings by using, in that case, I'm using elbow personal, for example. So, at the same time as I'm alternate picking, I also need to go down this, the guitar, <clears throat> and if I want to keep the angle of my pick consistent, so if I want to be perpendicular, for example, to all the strings, then I kind of have to use my elbow. 
as in lowering the, the, my hand, my bare hand, and up while the wrist does the picking or uh, the joints. Another approach instead is to simply arch. As you go down, your wrist changes angle. So. Right? And that works very well, for example, with distortion at times because you're still controlling noise, okay? Um, I tend not to do that much for the simple reason that as I'm, wrist, as I'm changing the angle of the wrist, what happens is also that the, the angle of the pick compared to the strings is changing, okay? So I'm getting different tone. So the top strings seem to have more attack compared to the, to the high spray. Because the angle is changing, okay? The angle of the pick is changing. If I keep it consistent, I get consistent tone uh, on the guitar. Uh, and so you'll see, you see my case, my, my, my shoulder going up or my elbow going up. You know? As I say, that's what works for me. It doesn't have to work for you. These are just considerations. Okay, uh, this has been a long, I think, <laughs> introduction, you know, it's almost half an hour, I think, just to introduce this. But I think it's important to introduce it, a bit like we did in lesson one, but it was a massive introduction. And the reason being that this consideration we've just done, they don't just apply to alternate picking, they will apply to Legato, we discussed that, they will apply to sweep picking, to economy picking, you name it. These are general consideration, and I know that most of you probably know all this stuff, yeah, and if I skipped something, please feel free to comment. Or maybe there might be one or two things that you didn't take into account or you didn't think of, and maybe, you know, you'll, you'll try some stuff. So now let's look into the, the actual alternate picking lesson. Now let's have a look at uh, the exercises I've prepared for you. Uh, first of all, let me show it to you. So as you can see, we have a, a PDF, as usual, uh, with alternate picking exercises. Um, it's five pages of it, which cover quite a lot of ground. I'm going to explain to you why these exercises, uh, so that eventually you can, if you understand the logic behind them, you can actually uh, create uh, create your own exercises. As you can see here, it says, start every exercise with a downstroke and then repeat the same exercise, starting with an upstroke. Also, practice exercise in 8 and 16, depending on what you feel more comfortable with, and then repeat the same exercise in triplets. Obviously, you know, uh, to do this and to be very thorough, you know, probably would take hours, especially if you're just starting out with this. Nevertheless, you know, you don't have to do all the exercises in one go. Uh, I'm just going to explain the logic behind why am I saying practice starting with a, with a, with a down strokes and then with an up stroke. Let's take, for example, exercise one. Okay, very simple, very common, very known, you know, just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and, you know, etc. The way it develops is simple as this. And then you move up a semitone. Okay, fairly simple, very common. Okay, now. You might ask, why do I do these kind of unmusical exercises as opposed to apply directly alternate picking to all the scales and arpeggios that we've done? And that would be a legitimate question. Um, the reason I, I rather separate it is we go back to the muscle memory and photographic memory we discussed in lesson one. So, as I said then, and I'll quickly repeat now, I can probably walk and talk on the phone at the same time and pay attention to what's going on in the conversation. I could probably not talk on the phone and read a book at the same time and have an understanding of what's going on in the book and in the conversation, okay? In other words, multitasking is not necessarily our thing, okay? So when I'm trying to develop a new thing, in this case, we're discussing alternate picking, I'd rather be able to focus on one thing at a time. So these left-hand patterns are easy enough to be uh, to go into your muscle memory rather quickly so you can actually focus on your right hand if you apply this to scales and arpeggios 
if you know them very well, then it's okay. That's what I would do. You know, so if I don't have to think of what my left hand is doing, I can focus on my right hand. Okay. But if you're developing with these lessons that I'm creating, probably at this stage, yeah, you probably know scales over five shapes in the entire guitar. So the first 15 lessons. But maybe they're still not part of your muscle memory. And in this case, even photographic memory, because this has to happen, but you're not looking there anymore. During these exercises, you might want to start looking here at all times to see if what you're doing is correct. It's efficient, actually. That would be the, the, the best word. What you're trying to achieve is efficiency for what it is the goal that you set up for yourself. If it's speed, uh, if it's precision, whatever it is. As a matter of fact, speed is the result of accuracy. So if you're uh, precise at slower speed, then it becomes easier to speed it, to speed things up. So don't fall into the trap of trying to do these things fast straight away. Have a look. You know, one of the most common mistakes I see sometimes is this end jumping a lot and the arches that you're creating being too wide. Okay. So by arches, I mean that compass motion that happens when you're ultimately picking. Okay. So if you don't look, you will never know that you're doing it, okay? That's, that's the idea behind. And very simple pattern. Also, these exercises, when he says, oh, I'm gonna show you. When he says one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, he actually also relates to the fingers I want you to use. So for this pattern, for example, one, two, four, is, uh, is literally first finger, second finger, fourth finger. I know some people like to use three fingers like this so that we stretches them. Again, nothing wrong with that. But in this case, trying to develop uh, an equal amount of uh, strength and, uh, you know, across the entire, you know, all fingers. So the first exercise, sorry, they said one, two, three, four is literally also one first finger, second finger, third finger, fourth finger. Okay. And when we, when we do exercises with three notes per strings and two notes per strings, that's going to become even more important that, you know, follow the fingers also, like it's not just the notes. Um, okay, why uh, am I asking you to do it starting with the downstroke, but also starting with an upstroke? Well, the reason is, the logic behind it is because when you're playing, you don't really want to be thinking about it, okay? You want, your, you want consistency. So it doesn't matter if you're starting with an upstroke, if you're starting with a downstroke. When, when, when you're playing, you just want to express yourself, okay? So you don't want to fall into the trap of having patterns. So it, everything is always starting with a, with a downstroke. So the downstrokes are always on the beat, and the upstrokes are always on the off beat. When we do triplets, you know, that goes out of the window. So getting used to also going up, down, up, down. you're trying to achieve is consistency of volume okay and that's why sometimes like to do this on a clean with a clean sound it can be beneficial because you're gonna spot straight away if your upstrokes maybe are weaker than your downstrokes or vice versa you're trying to have a consistency of volume as I said when you have distortion that dynamic range is reduced so you might notice it less you can even practice this stuff with a guitar unplugged you know with an electric guitar of course if you practice it on an acoustic guitar it makes it harder both for your left hand or right hand. So if you have an electric guitar, you know, I don't just unplug it if you, you know, if you don't want to make too much noise and just, you know, you can hear it, okay? You don't want to sound. You don't want to sound like that. You want to sound consistent. That you're going down and up on the neck will kind of question will kind of pose a question in terms of how do you want to approach that do you want to go angling moving your wrist down there so you're changing the angle of the pick at the same time or use your elbow okay so you're going down and up so this is the elbow and this is angling the wrist Okay, then 
above valid, whatever works for you. Um, and that's why I don't, I, you know, we are doing it going down the neck, up a semitone, and of course we're going up a semitone because that way we also have to deal with smaller frets, you know. But as I said, keep looking at your right hand, okay? Right now I'm looking at the camera most of the time, but very, uh, believe me, when I was doing this stuff, definitely looking at my, my right hand. As I said, start with the downstroke, start with an upstroke. In terms of speed, I tend to practice this thing at 100 BPM in triplets most of the time uh, because it's not too slow and it's not too fast. Of course, it's four notes per strings, so if you practice eight notes, it's going to feel very metronomic. You know, compared to when you play, if you're playing in triplets, uh, you're going to create some. Uh, rhythmic displacement, which is what I like to practice at the same time. When we do that in the future, maybe you can apply that. Practice this in 8 notes or 16 notes, whatever it feels comfortable. As I say, the goal is consistency, okay? That's what you're looking for. Um, make sure that you're accurate in terms of volume, okay? They all come across roughly the same volume. That's the, that's the important point, okay? We're not doing accenting yet, okay? Now, if you look at exercise two, it's basically the same thing as exercise one, just like uh, reversed. Okay, and this is more for uh, for you to practice uh, consistency also in your uh, left hand in terms of strength. But it's the same thing. Guitar leads me. So I start here and up here, okay? And then I'll do the next exercise. Maybe one day you do just start with downstrokes, and maybe the day after you just start with upstrokes. You know, you'll organize your work. I mean, you don't have to do everything at the same time. Uh, this probably takes me around one hour to go th all through it, you know in every possible version, but I've been doing this for a while. So, you know, I, I assume that if you're just starting out with this or you're not too familiar with these kind of things, you might take a little bit longer. So take, take small chunks at a time. As I said, for as long as you understand the logic is absolutely, you know, whatever works for you. You, you, you create your own exercises. Now, if you look at exercise three, four and five, they are the same thing. I mean, most of these exercises are going to be the same thing. It's just in this case, we're using first, second, and fourth fingers, so three notes per strings. In this case, one, three, and four. So first finger, third finger, and fourth finger. When practicing three notes per string, so in the case of these exercises, I just described to you, say, one, two, four, one, two, four, etc. The point of it, um, beside you playing patterns that you encounter when you're playing scales, for example. Take a G major shape one that we did in the first lesson. The first six notes went exactly like that. And then you had one, three, four, one, three, four. I'm describing fingers now. So in a way you doing this kind of exercise, you're dealing with finger patterns that you actually encounter when you do scales, which kind of should tell you the logic behind the fact that I'm doing this lesson uh, 17 as opposed to lesson 1. So you've done the scales, but now you understand better why these exercises are designed in a certain way. And so you can design your own. Say, for example, if you play a lot of metal, like you have three notes per strings, but in a stretch position, you might want to practice it this way. Right? The other point which is important, and that's why I'm suggesting you practice starting with a downstroke and with an upstroke, is because, of course, when you did four notes per string, uh, starting with the downstroke, for example, every time you change the string, you're always starting with the downstroke because it's uh, even numbers, right? Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So every time you change strings, you're starting with the same. Uh, if you start there on a downstroke, it will always be a downstroke when you're changing strings. If you start there on an upstroke, obviously it's going to be an upstroke. So up, down, up, down, up. This doesn't happen when you're playing three notes per string, and that's when the consistency 
we're trying to achieve becomes important because three notes per string or any odd number per string. You have down, up, down, and now when you're changing string, you're starting with an up stroke in this case. So up, down, up, down, up, down. So you, you are also dealing with the change of direction, and um, that's when the angle of the pick we discussed uh, in the introduction becomes relevant. Because if I'm doing down, up, down, okay, now I'm reversing up, down, up. In this case, the next picking pattern is going to be a down, but the last note I played is an up stroke. So in a way, I'm going towards my head, let's put it that way, with a picking. But well, when my next picking pattern, I don't know, my next stroke, whatever you want to call it, is in the opposite direction. So I want this arch to be as small as possible, so I can do that. So uh, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. I want this, which we're going to see in a second. This is called inside playing as opposed to outside playing. Uh, inside picking and outside picking. So that's what's the important part about three notes on a string, okay, when you're doing alternate picking. So definitely you want to have a look at your right hand and what you're doing, making sure that your, the arches you're designing, they're not too wide, okay? Otherwise you're going to go too far away from the next picking pattern. Um, let's see, let's have a look at the next exercises. So that was exercise three and four. Exercise five, uh, five, six, seven, they all deal with two notes per strings, okay? So, and again, one, two, one, three, one, four, it also refers to the fingers I would like you to use. You don't have to. I mean, what I mean is, for example, the one, four exercise. What I'm thinking in my head is finger one, finger four. So it would be like this. I know some people like to use first and third finger with that kind of stretch. Okay? I tend to see it in terms of wanting to, as I said before, I wanted to develop the strength on all fingers. So you know, again, treat it as you as best for you in a way. So you have this one, two. Sorry, uh, two, three. I'm talking about fingers now. Eh? Second finger, third finger. And reversed. Or third and fourth finger. And reversed. So, now that we've dealt with the... Um, Four fingers exercises, three fingers exercises, two fingers exercises in the context of alternate picking. The next logical step uh, would be to practice alternate picking in the context of string skipping. So and that's where exercise nine comes in. As you can see, the following exercises should be applied to all patterns presented in exercises one to eight. What that means is, first of all, we're dealing with what we're trying to achieve. Now, this, I designed these exercises Understand the logic behind it, you can design your own, okay? This is exercise one, okay? Now applying it in terms of skipping a string, so that you're also practicing string skipping. So instead of playing the second string, I'm playing the third string. Second string, fourth string, third string, fifth string, fourth string, sixth string. applying this to four notes per string. When I when I write apply to the exercises one to eight, I mean that can be done with three notes, with a pattern with three notes. And you should because as we say there is a problematic of the inversion of the picking pattern. Two notes per string. We're starting with an abstract. So basically what I'm trying to do with these exercises is to cover as much possibilities 
of what you can encounter when you're playing. So that when you're playing, you have a muscle memory in your right hand and a photographic memory that allows you to do that. that that's pretty much the extent of it. And as I said, right now I'm looking at the camera more often than not, but make sure that you actually look at the guitar when you're doing this, but look at your right hand. That's the entire point of doing, doing these exercises, like patterns, as opposed to you applying this directly to your major scales, for example. You know, if you created your muscle memory here and your photographic memory, then go ahead. I mean, you can apply this directly to scales and arpeggios. My suggestion is that you do dedicated exercises so that, you know, Okay, I'm repeating myself. Um, exercise uh, 10 is kind of similar. It's not really string skipping. It's just playing the, the same pattern in group of three strings. So what I mean by that, again, we go back exercise one and first string, second string, third string. Then you're back to the second string. Third, fourth string. Third, fourth and fifth. So you're operating at groups of three strings at a time, and you have something that sounds like this. strings, invert, start with an half stroke. You know. uh, okay, uh, let's move on. Exercise 11 and 12, these are particularly important. Uh, they're going to explain you another concept. So, the following exercises are designed for you to practice inside and outside picking. Mm. So, as for the previous one, practice starting with the downstrokes and then repeat the exercise starting with an upstroke. Actually, 11 and 12, as they're designed, as a matter of fact, they contain both. What I mean, and I'll show you to me in a second. Uh, when you're ascending, in, if you start with the, with the downstroke, you are doing outside picking on the way, ascending and inside picking descending. Uh, say and the opposite obviously if you're starting with an half stroke. Now uh, just quick mention of what, what I mean by inside picking and outside picking. When you're playing uh, alternate picking sometimes you will find yourself say if you have two notes on two different strings that if you start with a down stroke you're attacking them from the sides. Okay? So you're picking the notes those are the strings, you're picking them from the outside, okay? While inside picking, when you have two strings, means that you're attacking, your pick sits in between the strings. It's not on the outside of the strings, but it's inside. Okay, so if these are the two strings, inside picking means that you're doing this, but you pick, while outside picking, you're doing this, okay? That's that's the difference. And definitely you want to practice both the approaches, okay? That, again, when you're playing, it's not that you're going to be calculating when you're doing inside picking, when you're doing outside picking. It just happens to be in a way or another. So this exercise is kind of a little bit difficult at first. It's still one, two, three, four, but it's, uh, it's operating over two strings. So the first finger... The descending pattern is it's all outside picking. But when you come up, it's because you start on a downstroke, now it's all inside picking. get a feel of what's going on, but as soon as you tackle this exercise, which is exercise 11, you realize what I mean. The moment you, you start descending, you realize that your pick is operating in between strings. On the 
inside of two strings when you do it there, so you're on the outside. And as you can see, the important bit is the consistency. As you can see, there is a consistency of volume. Independently if I'm doing inside picking or outside picking. And of course, the same exercise if you start with an upstroke. Now, descending, you'll have inside picking. That's starting with the upstroke. As you descend, it's going to be all outside picking. Okay, so I suggest exercise 11, you do it starting with the down stroke and starting with the nine strokes because you know, you'll you challenge different things. And as usual, have a look on the guitar. You know. Exercise 12 is the same thing, it's probably one of the hardest exercises that you'll encounter here, at least it, it is for me, okay? Again, you're practicing not only inside picking and outside picking, but you're also practicing string skipping at the same time. So the arches you have to create with your right hand are wider, obviously. So, very specific things. On one side is addressing inside picking, outside picking, at the same time is also addressing string skipping. And again, same thing, you want to start with an half stroke. Exercise 13, exercise 13, 14, 15, they start dealing with you uh, playing alternate picking applied to uh, arpeggios. Let's put it that way. You study the arpeggios uh, and you have sometimes one note on a string or two notes on a string. In this case, it's one note per string, constantly. We start with group of three notes at a time, then we move group of four notes at a time, uh, arpeggios with five notes, arpeggios with six notes. So, as you can see, exercise 13 has got one note per string, and because it's over three strings, if this is a downstroke, of course, this is going to be an upstroke. This is a downstroke. This is an upstroke. Because it's, uh, it's a, an odd number. So, that's what you have to be particularly careful about. In this case, I wrote one, two, three in terms of fingers. As I said, it's three notes. You, you, you know, you could do this. You could do this using first and fourth. You could do it this way. It doesn't matter. You know, logic. Understand the logic. I'm trying to play one note per string, like kind of an arpeggio kind of thing, but so that I'm challenging the fact that it's down, down, up, down, up, down. Once again, you might, you know, in this case, you, you don't need to do, now I'm going to start with the upstroke, because actually the nature of the exercise already dictates that. You're already alternating. Right, it's down. If I think of the first note, okay? Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay? And you want to do this on all group of three strings for the simple reason that they have different thicknesses. So I'm going to show you the way I tend to do it. I tend to go up, then change the group of strings, come back down, change the group of strings, go up, change the group of strings. That's how I you know, tend to do it. So. Okay. 
exercise 15 is a combination of uh, exercise 13 and 14. So it's both ascending and descending. So you have some of this. And again, you change group of strings. These are very good exercises for when you're tackling them, you know, your page studies. Let's uh, move on. Exercise 16 deals with four notes at a time, so it's still kind of a, still kind of a, 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 an arpeggio configuration, um, but in, implying, uh, implying the use of four strings at a time. So. Again, you could do it this way, you could do any combination you want, you know, for as long as you get the point of it. And you can do it one direction, of course the opposite direction. Uh, in, the, in the PDF I just did it ascending and descending, so you have something like this. four strings, we're using different groups, so different groups of strings. First four strings, then the middle four strings. And the last, the bottom four strings. You could do it this way. It's actually a major seven or eight shots, matter of fact. As I say, understand the logic. Uh, episode 17, uh, episode, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> long day. Um, exercise 17, five strings. Now that's when things get obviously a little bit more complicated. So I designed it that way. more complicated the more our pages are probably um, the most complicated things when it comes to guitar in general and then to do it ultimately picking from that point of view Steve Morse is quite impressive with that and uh, John Petrucci you know also uh, falls into somebody who can really do it well so check them out uh, exercise 18 six strings uh, so the pattern I designed is this, but it doesn't matter, it's just, you know, one note per string and... Uh, and, you know, up and down the guitar, you know. Uh, Exercise 19 is group of three strings. Uh, it's a bit like, uh, let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, exercise 10, where you're operating a pattern over three strings, then you say first, second, and third string, then you're going back second, third, and fourth, third, fourth, and fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth string. In this case, you're doing the same, but this time is applied to kind of a, a simulated arpeggio pattern, okay? Um, so you have this. Exercise 20, same thing, this time applied to group of four strings, okay? So the pattern... Up the neck. 
Uh, now, as you can see, the following exercise tackled the problematic of encountering a different number of notes per string. So the logic behind exercises 21, 22, and 23 are related to you know, the scales you've just been studying in the lessons from 1 to 15. Let's take, for example, uh, G uh, in the shape of uh, E. And you have three notes on a string, three notes on a string, three notes, three notes. Suddenly you have two notes, and then you have three notes again. Same thing, say the shape of uh, D. Three notes, two notes, three notes, three notes, three notes, three notes. So you have sometimes the scales or patterns you're playing, whatever it is you're doing, you might have different numbers of note per string. So far, we always tackled something that was somehow very symmetric. Either it was four notes on a string, or sometimes it was three notes on a string, or sometimes it was two. In the case of the page, maybe you use only one. Now we're trying to tackle instead the situation where you have sometimes odd numbers on a string, sometimes you have even number. And because of the nature of alternate picking, that kind of reversed, as we know, reversed if you are tackling a new string with a downstroke or an upstroke. So these exercises are designed to give you independence from that point of view, so that when you're playing again, you don't have to think about it. So the first exercise uh, has three notes on a string, then two, then three, then two. So you have this pattern, for example. So in terms of fingers, it's one, three, four, one, three, one, three, four, one, three, one, three, four, one, three. So three notes, two notes, three notes, two notes, three notes, two notes. In reversing, you're actually playing five notes because you're doing one, two, three, four, five, two, three, two, three, two, five. Okay, so you have something like this. kind of gets used to this idea that, you know, in a way there is no such a thing as always starting on a downstroke or always starting on an upstroke. You know, when you're playing, you might find yourself in all sorts of situations and seems you really don't want to be having to think about it. So that's why these exercises are designed in this way. Exercise 22 is two notes on a string and then one note. Another string, so it's closer to what our pages looks like. So, say for example, again, we go back to G in the shape of E, one note on a string, and then you have two, then you have two, then you have one, 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 and if you play the octave, you have two. So, this idea that you might have sometimes two notes on a string and sometimes you have one. So, the pattern I designed is two note, one note, two note, one note, two note, one note, then again, two because they're changing. Third exercise, uh, same kind of concept. This time we're dealing with four notes on a string and then three. Okay, something close, kind of. Sometimes when we play chromatic kind of things, or um, say yeah, when we do pentatonics, uh, the blues one and then flat five. We have two notes, but then three, then two, then three, then two, and then again two. So in this case, the exercise is one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, and then vice versa. Four, three, four, three, four, three. This this was a was a long one because but as I said there is an introduction first of all which is kind of long and um, and also like uh, I I I spend time sometimes I kind of repeat myself I probably do that often 
um, in describing you not only the exercises that you find on the PDFs, but more importantly, hopefully, your understanding the logic behind them. Because that's the point of my lessons, not the exercises. The exercises are designed to achieve a certain goal. So if you understand what the goal is and the logic behind these exercises, you will be able to not only to create your own, but you know, when you're trying to learn something, if you identify the goal, you might identify the methodology or to get there. In this case, the goals were consistency, Okay, so it doesn't matter if I'm starting on an upstroke or on a downstroke. I'm alternate picking whatever I'm encountering. Okay, and sometimes I have four notes on a string, sometimes I have three notes on a string, so I wanted to deal with that. So that's why I designed the exercises that way. Um, then we dealt with string skipping, because that's also problematic when we count, when, when, uh, uh, when we're dealing with the alternate picking. And by the way, I forgot Paul Gilbert, I just realized. Incredibly alternate picker too, you know, <laughs> before you leave the comment, you forgot Paul Gilbert, Paul Gilbert. <laughs> um, of course, the problematic that alternate picking brings when we're trying to play our pages. So a bunch of exercises devoted to that. Uh, the fact that, you know, the number of notes we play on a strings keep changing, you know, in a way, if you think about it, all the the, the logic and the theory behind the three notes per string scales that we also studied during the first 15 lesson. Three notes per strings, the idea, in a way, is to kind of address the issue. So if you always have a constant number of notes on a string, allows you for a more fixed picking pattern, okay? That's the idea behind it, right? So that kind of technique, the kind of approach, addressed logically that particular issue. When it comes to alternate picking, I think the advantages of it is uh, consistency. I mean, you have co total control of the attacks of each note because you're picking each note, okay? Um, and when we look at legato, that's one of the things that we'll have to address. How do we get an attack from legato notes, right? If we want it, obviously. Um, and also, like, it really helpful in terms of playing metronomically. So, it, you know, it, 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 this becomes kind of your metronome, okay? And when we study accenting and all that kind of stuff, you know, in the future, um, it comes handy the fact that you have total control of the attack and volume of each single note, okay? By that, you know, these are some of the advantages I can think of off the top of my head. And of course, when you're playing a, with a clean sound, an acoustic guitar, you know, um, but even like this kind of guitar bar with a clean sound, right? With no sustain from distortion, let's, let's put it that way. Um, it's kind of less tiring because of course legato on, a, on an acoustic guitar, it's really, really tiring. And the, to achieve consistency of volume, it, it really puts strength, put um, stress on your tendons, right? On your, on your muscles. In your left hand, so alternate picking kind of makes it makes the job of the left hand a little bit less heavy. Downsizes, well, consistency of picking, you know, outside picking, inside picking, it's um, it's hard. You know, sometimes you know you can you can be much faster using legato. You know, not everybody is Aldi Mayo, like you know John McLaughlin. So uh, maybe I mean I'm probably I'm one of them actually. Like you know, until a certain speed. I say, I don't know, 120 BBM, 16 notes. More likely I'm doing things with alternate picking and probably above that. I never kind of looked into it, but I realized that when things get a little bit faster, I tend to use naturally like Adam, you know? So, as I said, like, you know, positives and negatives is worth exploring, I think. Uh, as I said, I don't, I, I don't think we should have one technique and we do everything without an opinion. If you want to, you can still do that. But as you study these things, you, you realize what works for you, what doesn't work for you. It's been a pleasure and I hope you're well and uh, stay well. Uh, until next time. Okay, bye.